don't know what to say, I need to think. What's up guys, it's Justin here, and today I'm gonna to show you how I make my thumbnails, which is probably the thing that I have the most fun doing with my videos, and clearly you guys want to see it as well. Although I love doing photography and editing, I'm not a professional by any means, and photographers watching this video are probably gonna be cringing the entire time at my very unconventional methods and just ways that I do things, but for me it works, and overall I'm pretty happy with the results, but I'm still trying to get better. So if you guys would like to see me do more of these, including how I record my audio and how I film my videos, go ahead and leave a like on this video, and when we hit 1,000, definitely add one of those videos to my list. So the setup we're using for this video is the MacBook Pro 13 inch without the touch bar 2017 model which I just compared to the Microsoft Surface laptop along with the new Logitech MX Master 2S mouse which I reviewed and loved. Since this episode is mostly done on Photoshop, I just got this keyboard cover from Editor's Keys, which is made for Photoshop CC. And how it's really helped me is that they have all of the keyboard shortcuts color-coded and printed on this keyboard cover. And as someone who just really needs to learn a lot of the shortcuts, whether it comes to Final Cut and Photoshop, this has really helped me out when it comes to remembering just the most important shortcuts at least. What's also great about it, and the reason why I'm using the MacBook 13 inch for this video is because I spilled coffee all over my MacBook 12 inch keyboard, which you guys probably heard about already and that computer doesn't work anymore so I had to go out and buy a new one and if I just spent a small amount of money on a keyboard cover like this then I probably still would have been using that computer right now so I'm gonna go ahead and leave a link to everything I mentioned in the description section below but I definitely recommend something like this for those who are looking to get into Photoshop seriously. So what I want to do in this video is take some of my favorite thumbnails and also ones that had the biggest before and after transformation and just go through some of the steps that I take with every single thumbnail that you can also try as well because they're not that complicated but once again, I hope I don't confuse you guys because I'm not the best teacher, but let's just go ahead and get started. So now that we're in Photoshop, I just want to start out by giving you some information about YouTube thumbnails. So the resolution that it's scaled to is 1280 by 720 and YouTube only allows us to upload thumbnails up to two megabytes in size, which is a decent size for what it is, but I wish it was more. Since the thumbnails do get quite compressed, instead of taking a full resolution image, which I used to do, what I do is just go into the video I was editing and export a still frame from the video of the frame that I would like to use as my thumbnail. In my case, I shoot in 4K on my Panasonic G7, so the screenshots coming out of Final Cut Pro 10 are 3840 by 2160 resolution, which will then have to be cropped down to 1080p to fit the two megabyte size. After I export the still frame, the first thing I do is normally try to edit the photo to the way I like it, and I don't actually do that much when it comes to color correcting beyond what I do in Final Cut Pro, which is maybe change the exposure, the white balance a little bit, as you can see from these thumbnails here. But something that I have used occasionally is actually the built in Photos app or the Photos app built into the iPhone using the fade filter, for example, and that is a look that I quite enjoy. It kind of just cleans up everything, and for this thumbnail in particular, I think it looked great. Occasionally, if the photo is really off, I will use Lightroom, but that's not very often. And within Photoshop, you do have the option to make some changes in the adjustments, including brightness and contrast, levels, curves, and exposure, for example, the vibrance and saturation, which I do use, especially for the minimalist photos, just to turn down the saturation. But this video is gonna be focused mainly on how I edit as opposed to the color correction, because I don't think I'll be providing much value in terms of how to color correct, because that's not what I'm great at. So the first thing I like to do with all of my thumbnails is to clear out the imperfections when it comes to the dust, some scratches on the product, and especially with macro shots like this, you might notice there are some blemishes here and there. So the tool I use is the healing brush. So let's just select J here and that brings us to the healing brush. And the steps to do this is, we're gonna go to the before here, is to zoom into the picture all the way and just find some of the spots that you think can be healed up. We're gonna set the brush size based on what we think we'll be able to um, cover up the little spots and all you have to do is draw over the objects and it will use the content aware in this situation to figure out what's around it and try to match that. So let's just quickly go through this. And although at the size of a YouTube thumbnail, you're not gonna really see any pieces of dust to start with, it's just really satisfying to do. And if you plan to tweet out the video and have the image inserted as well, a lot of people notice that the image just looks so clean and looks almost like a stock rendering, which is what I really like when it comes to removing all the little pieces of dust and also scratches on the product.
So that was just a really quick example in this situation of a macro shot where there's just some small pieces of dust that I wasn't able to get rid of before I started filming. Since I review a lot of products that have screens, including smartphones, tablets, and computers, something that I always do to just clean up the image is actually take a screenshot from the device and go into Photoshop and add the actual image of the screen on top of the product. Of course, if you're taking an image of the product straight on, it's going to be very easy just to line up the perfectly squared resolution of the display, but in a lot of situations, that isn't the case and this is one of them. After importing the screenshot that I took on my iPad for this iPad thumbnail, what I did was I turned down the opacity and then I go ahead and try to scale it based on the sizing as close as possible to the one on the iPad. And after you have done so, you just have to right click under the transformation settings, which is command T and select skew, which is something that is very handy beyond just doing thumbnails. What skew allows you to do is just stretch the size based on proportions to fit a certain square, which in this case is a little bit angular because the iPad is on an angle. And let's just go ahead and connect the corners here a little bit. You will have to play around with it and adjust the top and bottom um, scaling just to get it right. Um, so right there, we have to move that in a little bit. And just by lowering the opacity of that layer, it just helps us visualize how to line it up on the actual iPad. There we go. And this corner just needs a bit of a fix. And let's just zoom back out. I think that's good. And let's just turn the opacity back up to 100. And although that wasn't the perfect skew, you could see here that the before and after just has the screen, which is the center of the focus when it comes to this image, just pops so much more. And I think it looks much better. I try to do this for all of my smartphone related videos that show the screen as well. The skew transformation also works when it comes to text and other elements as well that you're trying to fit into a frame, which in this case would be the before and after of my What's On My Mac episode where I had to Photoshop the touch bar in because we could not see it from the image. What I did for this was take a screenshot of the touch bar on my MacBook and just have it on the top layer here. And we're gonna stretch it out just so it fits the approximate range of the touch bar. And as you can see, it is quite skewed, so we do have to extend it more than it was actually set to. And to get it into the proportions, I just went approximately based on the angle that it was set to and shifted it back and forth on each side, which you can see the horizon that we're using is the edge of the touch bar itself. And there we have it. So it looks like the MacBook has the touch bar on it with all the emojis and shit. And let's just turn down the opacity a little bit because sometimes it just blends in a bit better and looks more natural when you turn down the opacity, maybe five to 10%. But before I go on to the next example, I'd like to give a huge thanks for the sponsor of this episode, Videoblocks. It's great for creators and is one of the fastest growing largest stock video libraries with over 3 million videos, After Effects, motion backgrounds, which are all royalty free. On the topic of thumbnails though, its sister site Graphic Stocks also has a bunch of images and pictures that you can use for your thumbnails, for example. Both are royalty free so you don't get hit with copyright claims. This allows you to use these elements within your own videos and it includes the only contributor marketplace that gives 100% of the commission back to the artist in case you want to start selling stock video. You can also get seven days of video blocks for free, so you can go ahead and start downloading from the massive video library royalty free, completely free by checking the link in the description section below. So now that I've showed you the two things that I do the most when it comes to my thumbnails, I've taken some of my favorite recent thumbnails and I'm gonna show you the things that I did from start to finish. So for the OnePlus 5, this was just one of the videos that I did not know what to do for the thumbnail. So I ended up going back to the video and trying to figure out a frame that I think looked very natural and very attractive. This is just a look at the before and after. And yes, I did make the OnePlus 5 a little bit darker. I did also make the MacBook black because I just felt it fit the overall theme better. And the red also needed to stick out a bit more based on the original image. What I did for this image was once again, go back into photos and added the fade effect, which I think just gives it a nice minimalist and clean look. So I exported it from there and moved it into Photoshop. From there, I applied the same transformations that I did before and using the rulers, which is a great secret weapon, I was able to make the phone look like it was perfectly over head and straight using the skew function. So the command for this is command T and then right click, go to skew. And from there, we just need to drag the phone on the edge just to make sure it fits within the grid lines and it looks perfectly overhead. I think this one was pretty good, but just want to make the fine tune changes to make it look perfect. From there, we're gonna click enter and then I'm gonna stretch it to the same size as I had the final thumbnail. Of course, it's not gonna be 100% the same as my after because we're kind of going backwards here but there it looks pretty close in terms of the approximate location. From there, I use a quick selection tool that is what we're gonna use to make the MacBook black. And occasionally we might need to fine tune the selection by adding a feathering of maybe 0.5, just to make sure it was perfectly traced and that there isn't any areas left out. 
So just like that, we're gonna select it. And now that it's selected, we're gonna go Command C and Command V which will make an additional layer for us to correct on. So if you mess up, you can still go back to the original. In some situations, you would use the blending options and turn it into a color overlay that kind of paints over the entire thing. But in this case, it just looks too unnatural. And the idea that I had was to go into adjustments and brightness and turn down the brightness of the MacBook itself down to the color shade that I thought looked good in terms of a black MacBook. So I think that looks pretty close. And there you have it in terms of a color mask. As for the phone itself, we use the pen tool, which we're going to trace the OnePlus 5 with. And this does not have to be too precise because what we're doing is just changing the overall look of the phone itself, darkening it up a little bit, flattening it out, and just giving it the clean look that we put onto the MacBook. So let's just quickly select this for the sake of the example. There we go. Let's just go Command C and Command V for that. And let's set the image through the adjustments, the brightness once again. And I believe for this one, I also went into the vibrance and just turned down the overall contrast of the phone. That way it blends in nicely with the look of the MacBook. The last thing I did for this thumbnail was to make the red a bit more vibrant. I didn't really like the shade of it, so I wanted to just make it pop a little bit more. I think the red accents the theme of the OnePlus product quite nicely. So what I did was select the red portion, which was an iPad case, by the way. And from there, we're able to just go into the adjustments once again, go into the vibrance, maybe the hue and saturation to fix the tone of it. And from there, you can figure out how much you want to add in terms of saturation and the vibrance, just to make it pop a little bit more with the whole clean look of the matte black. So there you have it. And that's what I did for the OnePlus 5. And the next thumbnail is probably the one in recent memory that I was the most worried about after filming the entire video. That was the desk setup tour, and this is a look at the before and after. The before, I just wasn't feeling it. I thought it looked like crap. So we did quite a few things here in terms of just making it perfectly symmetrical and everything, which is very important to me. So once again, this is just a look at the before and after, which was a screen capture from the video, which I then turned into this thumbnail. The first thing I did for this one, once again, was use photos. And I know you guys are probably gonna hate me for using Apple Photos and built-in filters, but that fade filter is just something I love to use. And you probably see that on my Twitter, my Instagram all the time. And it sucks that they got rid of it in iOS 11, but I have to say it looks really good in this situation. It just made the wood look very rich. So this is a look at the before and after when it comes to using the fade filter, but this is just the beginning of what we had to do with this thumbnail. After adding the fade effect, I went ahead and exported this image as well and put it into Photoshop. And let's just get this out here. And after making sure that it was scaled properly, you could see that the before and after is actually relatively close, but the resolution is obviously a bit different because of the copies I had. And just try to spot some of the differences. So some of the issues when it came to this thumbnail prior to the changes I made was the monitor wasn't completely symmetrical because of the way it was tilted. And I also thought my desk wasn't flat, but it turns out the windowsill, since I'm in a basement office, wasn't exactly straight. So I ended up having to use a ruler and make sure that the window was perfectly level. The first thing I did here was get rid of the whole like safety warning on the blinds, which I found a bit distracting. And in this situation, we're able to just use the healing brush and just paint it out a little bit along the area that we need to fix. Obviously you do wanna kinda of take your time for the actual thumbnail, but what I used was using the healing brush and you kinda of just have to play around with that until it looks perfect. Moving on to the second issue, that was the display. So in this case, what we're going to do is actually make a separate layer for the display by masking it out using the pen tool. So let's just select this area all the way across. Once again, I apologize that this example is a lower resolution. I wasn't able to find the original image from my video. Selection, make sure it's feathered, and then make a separate layer, just paste it over. And in this case, we're gonna make it just a bit bigger. So we're gonna stretch it out a little bit, make sure it's nice and centered. And then I'm gonna open up a set of grid lines, that way we can skew it effectively and ensure that it was perfectly straight. So as you can see there, it isn't perfectly straight as is, so we're gonna go into the skew function, which is the transform command T, and then right click the actual object and skew it. And now we're just gonna zoom in and make sure we dragged it perfectly to the edges, um, at least when it comes to the horizon line of the sides and the top. And sometimes you might have to rotate it as well, but in this case, I think we can just quickly skew it for the sake of the example. And you can see that is also off on the top as well. Just shift it back and forth, play around with it a bit. 
Let's hit the check mark. And now you can see the monitor for the most part is perfectly straight. Next up, we're gonna put the wallpaper on because the colors were a little bit funky after we used the fade effect. So like the iPad video, we're just gonna put the image of the Big Ben right on here and just make sure once again that it is perfectly straight. Um, let's just skew it to line it up quickly. Probably set the opacity for this one to like 97, 98, just to let it blend in a little bit. And there we have it. So that looks pretty good. And the last thing I did for this thumbnail was go to the original image and I selected the entire background, which was the windowsill that wasn't straight. And since we have the monitor on its own layer, then the changes we make to the windowsill isn't going to overlap or affect the overall image as long as we make sure that we're cropping it a bit smaller. So from here, I have the window silk selected and I'm just going to set a level once again. It's just ever so slightly off, but I remember showing a couple of my friends this thumbnail and the first thing they told me was that window is a bit off when it comes to the blinds. And I didn't believe them at first, but it ended up turning out that way. And although it was a very minor change, um, in a thumbnail like this, I think it's important just to make sure everything is perfectly straight. So now we should be good to go and that's sort of what it looks like. So for the most part, this thumbnail in particular was just some changes when it came to skewing the monitor, the windowsill, adding the image on it. But aside from adding to the brightness of the final image, this is what I was able to get from the before and after. And I have to say, I was pretty happy with the result and this episode actually did quite well. So that's just a look once again at the before and after, after we skewed the display, the windowsill, and also added the fade filter. So this pretty much wraps it up for my video on how I edit my thumbnails. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. And these are just showing the main techniques I use. And as you can tell, it isn't actually too complicated. And what I mostly do is just clean up the image, the dust, the scratches, and just some small imperfections in the product. Since most of the stuff I do is product videography and photography using the healing brush, using the transformation and skew to be able to stretch the displays, the screenshots back onto the screen of devices and that's something I get asked about very often and despite it being very simple a lot of people actually don't know how to do it and I'm so glad I learned it after having other people do it for me for a while. When it comes to selecting items, I most of the time like to use the pen tool for items that are more symmetrical, such as the display or an item that is squared. But occasionally, if you're trying to color mask, like on the OnePlus thumbnail, you're gonna to wanna to take advantage of the quick selection tool because it's gonna be much more accurate and faster than tracing it by yourself. Although I don't normally like to use the adjustments built into Photoshop, including the brightness, contrast, levels, and vibrance, because it's a little bit harder to go back, just make sure if you're using these effects, you end up selecting what you're going to edit and making it into a separate layer. That way you don't have to go through many steps to undo it and not able to track the changes in your edits. As you can probably tell by now, I'm not a professional by any means, but for YouTube thumbnails, I have to say it is really fun to make and it's just so satisfying once you see the final product and try to learn more things in terms of Photoshop in general. But as always, if you guys have any questions or I didn't explain something clearly, please leave a comment down below and I'll try my best to help you out. But otherwise, thanks so much for watching this video and whether you've used Photoshop before or this is your first time, I hope I taught you something just through some of the small techniques that I like to use when it comes to making my thumbnails. Go ahead and leave a like on this video and your favorite technique down in the comment section below and I'll see you guys in the next one. Make sure it's actually recording. With that being said, I am a professional. You're not a professional. If it sucks, we can redo that section again.